sad news to report 13 religious sisters at the Felician Convent in Livonia, Michigan, have died from COVID-19, 12 of them passing within a span of a month. The nuns, all longtime members of the convent, lived, prayed, and obviously worked together. Some of them school teachers, principals, librarians, nurses, and musicians. The death of the 13 nuns could be the most serious loss of life by a group of religious sisters in the U.S. since the 1918 flu pandemic. May all of those dear nuns rest in peace. There is a debate raging over whether children should return to schools in the fall. Now, some teachers and teachers' unions are opposed to the idea, fearing a spike in COVID infections. But what does science and what do the studies and the evidence tell us? For insight, we're joined by Dr. Stephen Smith. He's an infectious disease specialist and head of the Smith Center for Infectious Disease and Urban Health in New Jersey. Dr. Smith, thank you for being here. There are reports of a vaccine, and the government just bought 100 million doses from Pfizer. Are you confident that this vaccine will be forthcoming and viable? Yeah, I think the problem, I mean, uh, good afternoon, by the way. Um, the problem with vaccines is our, the prim our primary focus on a vaccine is to prove safety. Um, unless you have a real high-risk population you know, that is exposed to a very virulent organism, you really need to, in which occasionally vaccinating a small number of people. If you're talking about mass vaccination programs, you really have to know that the vaccine is extremely safe because even if it's 1% and you do 100 million, that's a million people with that severe adverse event. So uh, that's the primary problem with vaccines. And, and of course, we have no reason to suspect a vaccine will work. Uh, the, hmm. While many patients develop antibodies after recovery, most, not all, develop antibodies after recovery from COVID, we have no idea if those antibodies are related to the recovery. In other words, they could be a marker of recovery. We see mm -hmm. people test positive with antibody and virus at the same time. And we see people who, uh, after a few months, the antibodies wane. We still think they're immune because of some mediated immunity. So. Mm -hmm. At proving efficacy and safety of a vaccine like this is not is no small feat. Further, mm. the epidemic in the U.S. is going state to state, region to region, and then we're not seeing it nearly as much. The incidence or frequency of the disease in New Jersey and, and New York City is unbelievably low, and we can't really explain it. And we had it for about eight not eight weeks or so, starting in the middle of March. And then it's just petered out. And I don't think it had anything to do with those social distancing. And then, of course, in New Jersey, where I practice, mm -hmm. where the 20 somethings have been not practicing, not practicing social distancing for a long time. We're not finding it in our community. Uh, my the Smith Center has done over 6,000 testing of New Jersey residents. We've had 23 positives, uh, only, mm -hmm. I think, about five in the last uh, five weeks, which was 2,600 people. In the hospitals, we're seeing some people come in with it. The same type of patient that before got extremely sick, that I mean diabetic, obese, right. other comorbidities, old, they're not getting as sick. And we can't explain that easily either, either except for viral attenuation. But it's so you totally think, different So you think situation. the viral load, you think the viral load is reduced now for some reason, that it's, it's, it's just dying out? Yeah, I think the, the data show that something's changed dramatically in New Jersey. The only sick patient we had in June came straight from Haiti, from EWR airport to the hospital. Mm. Uh, and he did well. But we're not seeing patients get sick like we used to. And we're not seeing them as frequently. Um, and mm. yes, the only explanation for that is we call viral weakening or viral attenuation. Uh, we don't expect wow. that as quickly. We expect it. We don't expect it as quickly. But I, we really have no other explanation for what we're seeing. And I, and I, I think the problem is people want to tell the virus what to do. I learned early on that I had to stop telling this virus what to do because it's unique in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And I was wrong about it in so many ways. So the data are the data. The schools and parents are trying to figure out how and when they should open in the fall. Uh, a COVID-19 study out of South Korea of approximately 65,000 people found that children younger than 10 transmit the disease to others much less often than adults yeah. do. And those between 10 and 19 can spread the virus at least as well as adults do. And I'll put this up on the screen. For those who lived with patients between the ages of zero and nine, 5.3 percent 
tested positive for COVID-19. And among those who lived with patients 10 to 19 years old, 18.6 percent tested positive. Now, the headlines of, of this report, reporting this thing, said kids over 10 spread COVID as much as mm -hmm. adults. The message being closed the schools. What's your reaction to this study? That, that, that data you cited on the under 10 or 10 under population has is, is been seen in other countries as well. It's not just South Korea. Those data appear to be real. They, they, kids do not get infected as often. They don't spread it as often when they get it, it appears. So I think I, that, that's more than that's several countries that are reporting similar data. So if you ask me, I, I think where you're going with this, and I think where the U.S. needs to go with this, is in states and areas where COVID has seemed to have, have already been in and done its damage is to start with elementary school. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and we, I think otherwise, what marker are we looking for? What are we, what are we waiting for? How long are we going to wait? And what are we waiting for before we do open the schools? Um, mm -hmm. And you just, you stay vigilant on the schools you open. I think the teachers obviously need to be selected to be at low risk for serious infection. And again, those risks are di diabetes, age, um, obesity, and I mean severe obesity. And uh, uncontrolled diabetes, especially, uh, and, and other serious comorbidities like congestive heart failure or, uh, you know, really bad kidney disease. So um, we know the risk factors for severe disease, so we can protect and isolate those uh, teachers and staff. And the, like you said, we know that the younger kids just don't get it and don't spread it. Yeah. So I think well, the evidence would seem to indicate that elementary school children are clearly not super spreaders. So okay. yeah, why not, you know, send them back to school? And a study of 2000 children uh, of and teachers at schools in Germany found very few coronavirus antibodies among them, suggesting that schools and young people don't play as big a role in transmission as previously feared. Tell us about that about about the the ability of young people to transmit the disease and why we don't see that spread <laughs> again I, you know we like to know why uh the, you know the theories yeah. on why they don't have as much of the ace2 receptor you probably read but it's not it we in medicine we do re much better if we observe and the pattern mm -hmm. is consistent these nine and under kids you know they're not catching and spreading they're not super spreaders and it doesn't matter why it matters that it's consistent and if that's consistent from Germany to Sweden to any country that's been studied, and South Korea, of mm -hmm. course, then we should we should consider that as really really solid evidence, and then mm -hmm. and, and look and look to do it here in a very controlled, very yeah. supervised fashion. And the, the kids are not the problem. There's very few of these young kids getting the disease or getting severe disease. So um, mm -hmm. you know, I think Sweden's experience is extremely similar. Um, so we have to. We have to start sometime, and I don't think waiting for a vaccine that we don't know is going to work and we don't know is safe is right. really putting it off m months to years. So what? Mm. how long do we might need to wait? How much data do we need before opening schools in areas where COVID has, uh, the incidence of COVID has really dropped? So there was an Australian study. Try. There was an Australian study, Dr. Smith, I'm sorry to cut you off, uh, where nine students and nine adults who were infected with coronavirus and came into contact with more than 700 other students and more than 125 staff members. And the researchers found that only two infections were known to be linked to those exposures. And even those are questionable. Now, these studies are small. They're relatively new. How do you interpret that? I mean, uh, uh, and I'm talking here about children above 10. Should they be going back to school, given what we know? Well, I don't think we know enough in that population. You know, we don't. I, you know, I think we. Should, I think it's, it's, if we focus on the under, the you know on ten unders, we'll and then get them open and get some confidence. And remember, a lot of this is psychology and confidence. We don't want to, especially mm. in this country where it's become a, a really, you know a political um, third rail almost. Um, yep. Everybody is it, it, it takes sides and political sides. There's nothing political about this disease. It's a horrible disease. I agree. But we have tons of data on it now. And we have to use the data. Let the, let, let the data guide us. Don't let our opinions or a priori opinions guide us. Let the data guide us and then make sure we collect our own data and, let, and then just yeah. follow the data. I can't tell the virus. I study, I've studied viruses in the lab. I can't tell them what to do. I do much better when I let the data point me in the right direction. 
Yeah, I, that, that's a good policy. In an interview with Good Morning America, the CDC director, Dr. Robert uh, Redfield, uh, Redfield, had this to say when asked about reopening the schools and if he would be comfortable with sending his own grandchildren back to school. Listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm 100 percent that they can get back to school. You know, I think it's really important to get our schools open. As I've said, it's not public health versus opening the schools for the economy. It's public health versus public health. I think there really are a number of negative public health consequences that have happened to our K through 12s by having these schools closed. Dr. Smith, what would you say to school administrators or school districts determined to offer only distance learning, even for very young children? And what are the public health consequences of not having kids in the classroom? Well, I'm not a pediatrician, but I have read reports in the, the, the petition signed by the, uh, the American I think, Pediatric Association, as well as mm -hmm. a large group of uh, UK uh, pediatricians, about the consequences of being at home and doing online learning. Um, so there obviously are tremendous fallouts or bad fallouts. So obviously school is not at all just about uh, uh, learning the ABCs and uh, learning some math. Um, it's a lot more about socialization. Um, so right. I think uh, Dr. Redfield's right in this, in this case. Uh, I, I agree with him. Um, we have to do it and we have to just follow what we're doing and follow the data. And I think we can do it. I, yeah. I know we can do it safely and we just have to do it wisely and not be influenced by politics. And, I agree. Uh, you know, we have well, to... Go ahead. Sorry. Doctor, when we look at the U.S. deaths from COVID-19 by age group reported by the CDC between February 1st and mid-June, uh, deaths in young people from babies to college students are almost non-existent. The most occur between the ages of 15 and 24 years of age, and that's 0.121 percent. The first age group to provide a substantial death toll are people 45 to 54 years of age. They account for nearly 5 percent of all the coronavirus deaths. More than 80 percent occurred those 65 and older. Given those numbers, given that data, is there any reason to believe it would be dangerous to send even older children, high school and college kids, back to school? Oh, no. I mean, I, I agree that we should. <laughs> my, my son's going to start at the University of Chicago come the fall, and we're sending them either way. <laughs> uh, and he's uh, 18 years old. <laughs> Just to get him out of the house. Uh, yeah, he, 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 I mean, for his sake, not, not for ours. I mean, uh, but for his sake, he, uh, he wants to get out of here. I don't blame him. Um, he said he's heard enough about COVID. Uh, um, and I, I know. I know he'll do well even if he gets infected. And, of course, he's been – and I, don't, not, I obviously tried to take every measure to not expose him. And my family mm -hmm. to it, and I, you know, would do everything I could. But, you know, being around me is exposure <laughs> in a way of itself because I come home, right? You know, allegedly covered with COVID, and certainly in, in uh, March and April. Um, hmm. But uh, I, I agree. I, I agree that we should. I think, I think politically, it makes sense to again. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying politically, but to do the elementary schools first. I don't think there's a big risk with any of these age groups. Um, you know, we've treated over 250 patients, over 200 of which were admitted to the hospital. We had two patients uh, under 30 that were admitted. Both did well. Both one was severely obese. Uh, he had a BMI of 45, meaning he was five foot eight and weighed about 300 pounds. Mm. The other was a type one diabetic, and he still did well. But we didn't see anybody else. And we see a lot of normally we see a lot of 17 and uh, year olds and plus. Um, mm. So. We, you know, that's a lot of patients we saw, and I didn't see any of them get sick that were under 30. Um, and again, we do see under 30s. It's not like we don't see them normally. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Well, I agree I hope, we should open I hope schools. teachers and parents are watching and heard that, because I, I think that's a crucial point that gets lost in all this. Might you get it? Could you get it? The cases are going up. The fact is, the, de the risk of, of, of death is very minimal in these young groups. And, and the data shows us that universally. Now, how yeah. important is the use of face masks, social distancing for kids in school? Did that have an effect on this disease, in your opinion? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm skeptical about the face mask. Prior studies looking at face masks for other cold viruses and coronaviruses didn't show efficacy. Obviously, they haven't been studied uh, in any sort of controlled fashion. Uh, you know, they, right. we, some, some studies get criticized for not being controlled, and then some studies don't get criticized when they're not controlled. Right. Um, these, uh, <laughs> um, personally, you know, when 
I hate wearing the, the masks, you know, and uh, I don't think they do anything really. You know, I, I, you know, I think they make people feel better. Um, but uh, I, I don't want to go too far out on the mask limb. <laughs> but uh, if people yeah. feel comfortable with it, I've. The funny thing is that everybody's an expert now, and so my, my yeah. friends who my friends who are not you know, have, have no background in virology or medicine argue with me about <laughs> COVID. So I stopped bringing it up <laughs> or viruses in general. <laughs> Um, Every everybody's so, a virologist now, except yeah. you, Doctor Smith, who went to <laughs> yeah. Yale and devoted your life to this. It's in every moment. Now, before we go, I want to talk about therapeutics. Um, there was that recent study published by the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, and it found mm -hmm. in treatment among hospitalized patients, use of hydroxychloroquine alone and in combination with azithromycin was associated with a significant reduction of in-hospital mortality compared to those not receiving hydroxychloroquine. Now, I know you've treated a lot of patients with this drug. Your reaction to the study, and what have you seen clinically? Uh, I think the study was well done, and I think they looked at it through the correct lens. That is one that's apolitical. Uh, that's how I looked at our data. I started using the French regimen, the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin when the data came out early from them. Uh, because I had nothing else, and I knew I could, I I mm. made sure I gave it safely, and the drugs are are uh, not toxic, and we we have data to show that. Then our data along the way, I was collecting data to make sure we were doing things safely, also aligned with theirs and showing efficacy. And what I mean by that is we had patients that stopped early, get worse again, go back on the drugs, and get better again, and that's mm. that's proof, <laughs> you know. And then our other wow. data are that. If you got a certain amount of hydroxychloroquine, your innovation rate just plummeted to non-existent. So they, we, I, I, so our data uh, prove it works. Uh, their data shows it works. Yeah, a lot of the now trials, this drug has been in use, doctor. This drug has <laughs> been in use for sixty plus years for uh, yeah. malaria. I know friends with lupus who use it. Should the FDA reauthorize its use very quickly? I think the FDA should have stayed out of it to begin with. The FDA, what they actually did was they authorized, expanded use, authorized a really low dose of hydroxychloroquine. And that's what they retracted. They're not saying hydroxychloroquine doesn't work uh, against COVID. They're saying that dose may, doesn't make sense <laughs> to work. So um, mm. I think they were better off when the FDA stays out of this. And infectious diseases, over half of our first line agents are what we call off label. In other words, they're studied by mm. clinicians but they're not FDA approved for that indication. And they're, these are first line regimens and first line choices of antibiotic therapy are, are often uh, not FDA approved. And I think we would have been better off, I know we would have been better off as a country if the FDA just stayed out of it. Uh, yeah, leaving it, it to the discretion of, of those who know. Yeah, there was a lot of confusion because they approved that low dose. And they're like, well, right. in retrospect, the study that that, that low dose suggests that low dose was just a computer thing that was a horrible study. So they said, listen, that low dose doesn't work. We don't really know about well, the higher I, dose. I, I'm glad you reminded us early. And again, this is a good example of politics getting in the way of, of, of the data and in the way of true medicine. So I thank you for pursuing both the latter. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Smith, for your time and your, your clarity and insight. Thank you. Good day.